Hi, I'm Pat Iyer. Would you like a step-by-step -step process for writing your book, one that removes all the guesswork? Wouldn't it be helpful to know exactly what to do to get your book done so that you finally finish it? Would you love to remove the risk that no one would want to read your book? You're in the right place. You'll get tips on how to manage your time so you'll be able to complete your book. Imagine how you will feel when you make an impact on others with your knowledge and open the doors to your bigger life. You'll revel in the joy of completing your book and getting a profound sense of accomplishment. Join me at the Get Your Book Finished course. Here's the plan. I'll work with you for three months. We'll start the process over a weekend and then you'll have the roadmap you need to get your book finished. Go to patire.com P-A-T-I-Y-E-R dot com and scroll down on the home page to the section about Get Your Book Finished course. Check out the details about my course and grab your spot now. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal... Oh, shoot. I'm going to stop that. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business. And I have with me today a person who I met Originally, Julianne, I think it was with um, C-Suite Network Advisors. I, I think, think so. Right when they, yeah, way back like three years ago or something. And we liked each other and swapped podcasts at that time. And it may even have been when we had a meeting in Texas. I seem to yep, recall in Dallas. Dallas, yes. We were Julianne. in that beautiful office building. Yes, and there was a nice restaurant on the ground floor. We had dinner that night before. Julianne Sullivan is an author of seven books. We are both part of the C-Suite Network Advisors, which is the podcast platform that we're using for this podcast. It is the largest business podcast network in the world. And Julianne and I have exchanged... Um, information. She's had me as a guest on her podcast, and I'm pleased to be able to bring her on this podcast as a successful author and a, an expert in several areas, which we'll get into as we talk about the books that she has written. Julianne, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Pat. I'm so happy to be here. I always like sitting and chatting with you, so this is another excuse. <laughs> well, thank you. And our listeners get to Look over our shoulders and listen in as we talk about your writing career. You just, as a, a few minutes ago, as we were beginning, held up a book as your first book. I'd love for you to hold that up because that's going to give us a real good visual. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see a picture of a book that Julianne is holding up that looks like it is bound with combs, and it's yeah. called Life Lessons. Yeah. And it's definitely her first book. Tell us about <laughs> that book, Julianne. So I've always been a writer. I have journals and journals and journals, even you know, since the time I was a teenager. You can imagine all the angst that's included in those. And I wanted to pick out uh, some short sayings that I've lived by my whole life, and that was life lessons. So. I'm just going to pick one. So this one was, feelings are emotions I allow. No one puts them on me like a dress. That's what the book was like. It's filled with life lessons. Um, I'm actually thinking of finding someone to do little drawings to go along with some of these and reissuing this, actually. Um, but this was my first one. Um, it wasn't published, right? I had it printed and I would sell it back of the room type of thing. Um, and mm -hmm. that's what I did with it. But it was an accomplishment. It took me through the process of writing somewhat. The more books I did, the more I understood the process. Um, but I'm still very proud of it. Life Lessons took you then to your next book. Tell us about how your thought process changed or your book production changed between book number one and book number two. Okay, I will. 
Uh, book number two uh, looks kind of the same. Um, again, it has an ISBN number, so that was something that I didn't have before. But again, it wasn't available on Amazon or anything like that. And it was written specifically, it's called Shape Up for Success, Seven Keys to Ease Your Mind, Open Your Heart, and Find Your Place in the World. And it was specifically written with a course that I did for students and um, to, to help them start their success in the world. So it had a specific reason, which was a little different. It had, um, it was much more goal oriented and it had exercises in it. So it was more like a, a workbook. And I was just beginning my speaking career. So that's how that, that book came up. Uh, around and uh, I did do it in a few schools wasn't like I made a lot of money on it or anything like that um, never had it edited by anyone else you know so it was still uh, in my baby stage of writing I'd say but and uh, I actually had a graphic designer do the cover you know so like I said each book taught me something more because when I was doing this, there weren't book coaches like you now uh, that could help you learn all the questions you don't even know what to ask when you're doing a book. It's like doing a podcast. You and I know that. I don't know about you, but when I started my podcast, I had a coach. And mm -hmm. what I found out was there were questions I didn't even know to ask, right? Right. Yes, I hired a man to help me with all the technology because I knew I needed a podcast, but I was baffled by where does it go? How do I hook it up to iTunes? What do I do with the cover art? And he walked me yeah. step by step through that. Very Intro, helpful. Intro, outro, music, whatever it is. There's so many moving parts. I think I've coached more people out of doing podcasts. You know, I just talked to someone this morning who said, maybe I should do a podcast and I know what her life is like. And I went, no, it'll suck all your energy, right? <laughs> like she just, she doesn't have room in her life for a podcast. You know, it's, it's time consuming, which is wonderful. I, I mean, I loved every minute of doing my podcast, but you got to be in the right frame of mind. Same with a book, right? You can just write a book forever, kind of like going to school forever. Yes, you can. And let's go back to that book number two for a moment, because some people are listening on our audio channels and some are, are watching on our YouTube channels. When you held it up, the it people on the YouTube... It was coil bound. Yes, thank you. That's what I was getting at. So we yeah, could describe... Yeah, it was coil bound. It was something I published. Again, it wasn't on Amazon. It wasn't on print on demand. I don't even know if I knew about print on demand at that time, to tell you mm -hmm. the truth. Let's see if I even have a year in here to figure out where we were at with this. So this is 2012 that that book came out. And what you just brought out is, is a really great point in terms of utilizing the book because you created that book to go along with the course and turned it into a workbook. So it took your knowledge and moved it into a different way of utilizing your knowledge for the sake of the students, particularly those people who love the ability to learn something and then directly apply it by writing in a workbook and solidifying their knowledge. And that's yeah, so part, part of what I did was we would use that workbook in the class, right, to do the, to do the um, exercises in there, but we do them together like on a whiteboard or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it had a specific purpose. So the first book was just me being ethereal. The second book had a specific purpose. All right. And then you move to book number three. Tell us about book, book number, number three. three. So book number three, and there's only six, not seven. I, I, I misspoke before. Book number three. Um, so here it is. It's spiral bound, but I actually did. You can go on Amazon and buy a little bit of gratitude goes a long way. Um, I had 
been a certified laughter leader for a couple of years, besides my others speaking on communication, collaboration, and change, which moved into culture, but, you know, journey. It's all a journey, right? You get <laughs> changes and you got to follow the journey. Can't be doing the same thing I did in 2012. Doesn't work. Um, so I wrote a little bit of gratitude goes a long way and it is 30 ways to be gratitude. And guess what? There's an exercise for the reader for every one of those. Um, this was a much shorter book. I did have an editor look at this. Um, again, I used a graphic designer. Um, I did the spiral bounds because I could get a heavier paper hmm. and I would sell these from the back of the room, but they are also available still on Amazon and, uh, you know, without this spiral bound that Amazon won't do. So another step forward, right, where I had somebody else do the layout right now this is another part of writing a book right you just don't do a manuscript it has to be laid out properly to look nice and because i had all these lines and everything i did that actually i did that with shape up also because i had little boxes on pages that would have uh you know specific ideas to highlight mm -hmm. um so anyway this has been one of my greatest sellers though because it's the idea of having more gratitude in your life just is a good thing. <laughs> it's a good way to live. And right now, actually, I should probably be doing more social media about this book right now. Because <laughs> I'm sure yep, people could there use are people more gratitude. Always, always focused on the need for gratitude. It's so yeah. easy. So again, to this about. was very focused to one idea, and um, and definitely very proud of this book and its ability to be evergreen where something like uh, Shape Up for Success has come and gone and will probably never be seen again. You know what I mean? Why do you say that? Uh, because I'm not going to be speaking to educators. I'm just not going to do that, right? My, my speaking life has changed, so it's not useful to me, and it's not on there on print on demand. So that's why, for those two reasons. I understand. So it's not that people have lost interest in the topic, but you've moved on to different areas of expertise in what you speak about. Exactly. And you and I both know as, as speakers, Pat, that um, you've got to move how you move, right? Your expertise changes, you grow, you mature in your arena. And now I talk about culture. And, uh, you know, when I first started speaking, I used to say, I can talk about anything except algebra. And I thought that was a really cool thing to say. But the more I got into the speaking world, I realized that was the worst idea I had. <laughs> and much better to be niched into uh, an area of expertise and mm -hmm. focus on that. So that's where I do all my research and speaking now. I heard a speaker talk, and I, I don't remember his name, but he said, every time you add a comma to, to the list of topics that you speak on, you're automatically decreasing your income. And your value. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because how can you be an expert in 10 areas? You, mm -hmm. you can. Right? Because if you took the time to be an expert in all those areas, you wouldn't have any time to share your expertise. <laughs> True, true. Yeah. Well, you moved on. Tell us about the progression. What did you change with the next book that you wrote? So the next book, I was invited to do a compilation that um, had to do with the principles of Napoleon Hill. And um, I've always been a Napoleon Hill advocate. And uh, so this was Journeys to Success. And I was one of, mm, I'm looking here now. Uh, oh, there were 31 of us. And Tom Cunningham, who is unfortunately no longer with us, this was his last compilation book. So it's pretty special for me to be a part of this. So I wrote a chapter in this book. 
And it was how I got to be an international number one best-selling author. And can you tell us the title of the book? Yeah, Journeys to Success. And this was volume seven. So I am, um, yeah, I hold this near and dear to my heart for many reasons. One, because it made me a number one international bestseller mm -hmm. author, which no one can take away from you once you get, even if your other books aren't. And two, um, it was Tom's last compilation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has, gives it some special depth also. Were you part of a... Uh, a campaign in which you as a contributor were asked to send out emails to ask people to buy the book at a specific time. Is that the model that was in place for that book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had 31 people. Everyone was asked to hmm. send emails to X number of people uh -huh. and ask them to buy. And like anything, the more marketing you do, the more people you have supporting you and the more people buy your book. And uh, I'm sure you've been around speakers who do a lot of pre-ordering mm -hmm. on their book. And then all those orders go on day one and then they're a number one bestseller. Right, right. So I there's all kinds of ways to do that. And uh, with a compilation, it's a little easier because you have more people uh, committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my coaches at one point a couple of years ago had a compilation book. I think I was in volume two and I think they're up to volume four now. And it was a very similar process with a person who coordinated all of the contributors, gave us emails to send out, told us what time frame to send them out to. And that book, got number one in seven categories. That's great. And yeah, in several countries overseas as well. Excellent. But it, it does require a, a coordinated effort and oh, yeah. people cooperating. And was there a financial investment asked of you to be part of that compilation book? There was, um, but, and I have, you know, I've had people come to me before with that right? You know, we'll edit it. We'll do this. We'll do that. I mean, you know, what do people do for you? There are some people who charge you $15,000 and I'm sure you've met those people and you go to them with an idea and they help you write and they help you distribute and they do this. And then there's people who do it for a lot less. So this was a very, what I considered a very small contribution because of my relationship with Tom, I think, um, that allowed me to have my name on the cover. And so um, it was worth it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like people had approached me before and it's a decision you have to make for yourself. Is this, does this have value? Is it going to give you the ROI that you want? And um, I was certainly pulled in because it was Napoleon Hill. And I was pulled in because it was, I don't know, a thousand words or 1500 words or whatever it was. It wasn't like writing a whole book. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of factors. And I think your listeners need to think about that. It's, don't be too eager, right? You, you really have to make a decision, even if you're writing your own book, because that takes money and whatever, and time, time. Don't forget about your time, which is worth money. Um, so you, you have to really look at the whole picture and decide at this point in time, is it worth it for you? And I don't think anyone can really answer that for anyone else except yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to the next book that you did. You've sure. And so the next book I did was, uh, whoops, uh, Blueprint for Employee Engagement, and it's 37 Essential Elements to Influence, Innovate, and Inspire. And the way I did this book was yet again a whole different process. I was at a C-suite event and 
Phil Jones was there, who I think you know. And he, they had, you know, authors there giving away their books. And I think the name of his book was The Magic of Words or Magic Words or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I looked through his book and it was pretty simple, straightforward, you know, little bits of great information. And as I looked through it, I went, I could do that. Because I was deep into employee engagement. I had a ton of great ideas. And uh, Sheila Anderson and Kathleen Caldwell, who are also part of the C-Suite Network, were there. And we made a pact to get online with each other every week to get our books done. Separate books, not together. And I started out with this making a list uh, of what I wanted to cover, what ideas I wanted to cover um, in this book. And so people say, how'd you come up with 37? Well, that was the list I came up with. So that's how I came up with that number. So I started with that. And then in this book was more formula formulaic. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Followed a formula. There you go. And it was uh, the definition of the word, um, a what's in it for me. So an explanation for the reader of why it was important and something they could do right now, right? An action they could take related to like number 20 is fun, right? So I tell them why fun is important in the business place. I give them an idea they can utilize right away. And then I had a quote by some celebrity relating to that. Uh, so, um, and Jeffrey Hazlett, the CEO of C-Suite uh, Network and Radio, um, he did my, uh, he uh, did the, um, quote on the front of the book. I got a million dollar idea just from the first three tips. Hmm, nice. This was the first time I asked for endorsements. Another step in the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I asked people to write endorsements in here. Uh, I got a whole bunch of them. People were very, very kind. Um, the first time I did a book under LNE Press, which was me, came up with a name for uh, press. LNE st uh, stands for Learning Never Ends, which is my DBA for my company. Nice. Very nice. Uh, yeah. So uh, definitely used a graphic artist because I have, uh, you know, icons in here and all that kind of stuff. And so there was a lot more, and even though it's a small book without a lot of words per se, it took a lot more work because the layout was a little tricky and I followed this formula and had to search for quotes because I created this formula, but it was directly related to the work that I do because... Um, you know, employee engagement and culture is such a big idea. A lot of people don't know where to start. Uh, so I told companies, if you worked on each of the tips in here for a month, that's 37 months worth of work mm -hmm. on your culture. So um, it's been very successful. I'm, I still like it very much. It's still a really good book and it's on print on demand. So you can also get Blueprint for Employee Engagement on. Um, on uh, Amazon and uh, my mastermind at the time helped me with the cover completely changed several times again don't be too eager you know I my own personal opinion and I'd love to know yours Pat is um, when I look at my cover of my book I want to smile mm -hmm. and if I don't then I need to come up with another idea and that's what happened with blueprint so, and we have 
one more book? Do you have yeah, one more book? Yeah, we've got one more book, my latest. Oh, my love. Your baby. So this book, here's another <laughs> iteration of writing a book. I had no intention of writing a book because I just wrote Blueprint. And I had a company come to me and say, we'd like to publish your next book. I don't know why. And, you know, I actually wrote them an email and said, why me? <laughs> Because there's so many people out there. And um, I never got the answer to that. So I never asked again. Um, and they actually did everything. And I didn't have to pay a dime. Hmm. Uh, and I, you know, I got an agree a proposal from them. Because I didn't know how to write a proposal to them. So they sent me an agreement. I, the whole thing was so serendipity. And I um, had... Uh, uh, I'm forgetting Russ's last name. You know, he's a part of NSA. I had Russ him. Russ Riddle. Russ Riddle. Riddle. Great guy. Um, I had him look at it because I don't know what I'm looking at. And I said, am I really just going to get shared, rev you know, royalties from this? And I don't have to do, you know, put out any money. And he said, yep. And I went, okay, I'm going to write a book. I mean, I couldn't pass that up. It was an <laughs> opportunity I just couldn't pass up. And um, this came from my podcast. And here's an interesting story, if I have time to tell this. I was at a SHRM conference, and I'm going to forget the man's name, but he's the co-founder of uh, Fast Company Magazine. And he stood up on stage and basically told stories of the companies they had put into the magazine. And I had already been thinking about, couldn't I utilize my podcast to tell a story? Because I've interviewed some amazing people. And when I saw him do that, I went, I can do that. So I bought his book to see what he did. And that's um, how I came up with Catalysts of Culture, How Visionary Leaders Activate the Employee Experience. And, um, and then, in case your readers, uh, your listeners uh, or readers want to uh, understand this, I decided I was going to write the four about the four attributes that all these people had in common. Then I had, then I picked fourteen interviews, which was really hard, and I decided I was going to just clean up their transcripts. Right, I was going to do a, a couple of paragraphs overview. I mean, introduction to my relationship with these people and then have their transcripts, and then an overview at the bottom. And when I started, I thought, that is really cheating, using the transcript. Well, let me tell you, for anyone who thinks that, when you have to clean up a speaking interview into something you can read, that is not cheating. <laughs> And the reason I did it is because I wanted people to get the character of the people, which there's no way I could rewrite. So I'm very proud of this book. It has a lot of great ideas straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so those are my books. It's been, I've, I've had setbacks. I've had drastic changes from, you know, life lessons to catalysts of culture. Um, and I think, you know, you, you just got to push forward. And most important, I'll go back to, you need to look at the situation, look at your why, right? Why you're doing what you're doing and if it will be good for you. Don't make any fast decisions. Um, there's no quick way to get it done. No one can guarantee you know, it's going to be a bestseller. And honestly, very few people are making their fortune off of books. Wouldn't you agree, Pat? I agree. I tell people it's the doors that are opened because you've written the book is where you make the money. Cred. Big cred, I think. Mm-hmm. In fact, and I interviewed Mitchell Levy, and he talks about cred dust. That yeah. You get that credibility from having been the author of a book. That's what Businesses That Care podcast did for me. Once I interviewed the CEO of WD-40, that got me in a lot of doors. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, you've shared in this podcast, Julianne, your journey. I'm exhausted. <laughs> 
but I'll bet you have another book in you. Well, I like I said, I'm thinking of resurrecting life lessons. I think my next book, not sure, because I haven't decided to go down that path yet, but I think my next book is more going to be more towards life lessons than culture. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to get back into my psychology brain. You know, I have a psychology accounting brain. I one, see. One degree in psychology and one degree in accounting. And um, I'm very right left brained. And um, my creative side is growing as I mature. And I, I know that from certain tests I keep taking, right? So I see the shift. So uh, I, I really think my next book will lean more towards life lessons. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think of writing a book called My Mommyisms, you know, Lessons My Mom Taught Me. <laughs> Another title I thought of was uh, Riches to Rags and Back Again. That's interesting. So I'll let you know. <laughs> yes. I've been through riches to rags and back again as well. That's an interesting cycle. It's kind of like a U shape. Yeah. Honestly, I seem to be happier when I'm not living a high life. That's just me. That could be a topic for a whole nother podcast, Julianne. Yeah, I really, uh, yeah. A lot less to be concerned about is what I find. For me. You started your journey. I'll do a quick recap. You started your journey with using the tools that were available to you at that time. And your first book was probably written before Create Space, which has now become Kindle Direct Publishing, was so popular and so easy to use. It has improved a great deal over the years. And you've shown primitive. us... Primitive. That book was primitive. <laughs> Yes, but it exists. It got you from what I refer to as the hardest number is that going from no books to the first book. You have to get over that hump. There are a lot of people who get stalled right at that spot and never go further. And the point was you took those life lessons out of your brain and put them on paper. You had them comb bound and were selling those in the back of the room when you were speaking. And then you progressed into a spiral bound book that is used by students or was used by students as a workbook who were taking a course that you were teaching and then you moved into having a professional cover done with a graphic designer and with each book you added a new stage whether it was layout or editing or being part of a compilation book that became a bestseller through the combined efforts of all of the authors and the editor of that book You've experimented with different genres. You've experimented with different formats. And all along, you're building your books based on your knowledge and selling them in different ways, whether it's back of the room or to students or on Kindle Direct Publishing. And I think you've shared with us the importance of not leaping at the first opportunity to be part of a compilation book to look at the match to your expertise and the financial investment and what that's going to do for your business. Uh, like me, you've also used podcast transcripts to create books. I have created seven books so far from editing the transcripts and pulling out the best content from all the podcasts that I've done to create another body of work, which is for you, I think it's fascinating of looking at successful people and you analyze those probably with that psychology part of your brain <laughs> and pulled out the four characteristics that were most indicative of success and then used those to identify the transcripts that you wanted to bring into the book and edit, which forms the basis for your most current book. And now you're coming full cycle back to the first one and seeing what you can do to rejuvenate that or change its appearance. I have a, um, 
a person I can recommend to you who does editing work. I just uh, interviewed Jennifer Fondreve yesterday for the podcast. She did a book on mergers and acquisitions, and she hired a person to create images for her book who's more of a caricature artist. Awesome. And she loves the work that he did. I, I've seen his work. She gave me a copy of his, her book before we did our podcast. So it's clear to me in talking to you, Julianne, first of all, you're the first accountant I've ever met who has a psychology degree also. (laughs) They usually don't occupy the same brain. So congratulations (laughs) on that. I've had accountants who I wished had a psychology degree because (laughs) they couldn't communicate quite as well as I needed them to, to be able to explain financial terms to me. So my hat is but off here's the other that. part about that so that shows that sometimes you don't know what something will do for you. When I finally quit accounting, I realized I had this unique perspective of business, right? I understood the functionality of business, but I also understood human beings. And so, and just about the same time, employee engagement, the idea of employee engagement started to balloon and it was just a perfect marriage. Mm-hmm. That's well put. You understood business, but you also understood people. You understood numbers and you understood people. I'm sure you have met people who have one of those, but not both of them. Yeah. My son, actually, he's, uh, he just last year got hired for a new job. He's a geek to the nth degree, mad skills in that department, but he's also very good at communicating. I have no idea where he got that from. And um, so that's why they hired him. Because Mm -hmm. again, in that field, to have tech and communication be together is rare. It is. I have a son who got his master's in computer science from MIT. And after his first semester, he came home and he said, Mom, I understand why people are called geeks, because they would rather relate to the machine than they would to other people. My son is like yours. He has, he's charismatic and understands how to communicate with people. Plus, he has that highly intelligent tech, math, computer science. Right. Brain. But they don't usually exist. They're a rare breed. In the same. Yes. And I think ultimately, you need to have a blend of both, or you need to have somebody, if you're the highly technical person or the highly accounting brain type of person, you need an interface so that your knowledge can mean something to the people that you have to communicate with. Because I think it's rare in life that you can just spend all your time communicating with a machine. There has to be some way that what you're doing is going to be meaningful to those people around you. And you've got that. (laughs) Yes. I have enjoyed so much our time talking today, Julianne. How can people find out more about the books that you've been sharing with us that are available for purchase or about the services that you offer? Thank you so much. Uh, For those of you who are looking at a video right on the screen, you've been staring at my email address and phone number and the tail end of my email address is my website. If you Google Julie, and the next word, Anne, with no E, Sullivan, you'll get pages and pages of me. It's impossible not to find me. Um, please, you know, go to LinkedIn and connect with me. Uh, I'm always happy to chat and, you know, let people know uh, maybe some of the obstacles and how to get around them or people to help them with those. Um, I do do coaching for people who want to get going with podcasting. And of course, we're connected with the C-Suite Network, which is a wonderful place to host your podcast. Um, I've had a great time. I always like talking to you, Pat, because you're mad smart yourself. Well, and you. uh, I, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. And again, I think people should just know, just think about what it is you're doing and know that change is good. 
I don't even like to use the word change anymore because you say change and people just cringe. So I use the word challenge. Challenges are good. You can overcome them and they make you grow. I mean, look, if you listen to where I went through with all my books, they're hardly related sometime, but it's still the same me, right? I've grown, my books have grown, they've gotten better and better. And uh, it's... I think that the journey makes you a better person, not only for yourself, but for the people you serve as well. And you've been through quite a journey with your books. And I know that there are more books in you. After the rejuvenation of the first one, I'm sure that there'll be more because you love to write and you've got a lot to share. Yeah, I, I well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. It's like giving birth, right? Um, which I never really did. My son is adopted, but just from what I've seen in the movies and heard from my friends, um, and even bringing my son home was kind of like, you know, a birth. And you just see it grow, right? We've, we, we've seen our sons grow and they're not the same as they were as toddlers. And I think that's what happens when you create a book. That's how it is for me anyway. It starts off as an idea. You might have a title. I always find a title comes from the writing, um, but maybe not. You have a formula or you don't have a formula and you just kind of let it blossom and you have to go through the journey of your book. I think for me, my opinion, to have everything figured out about what your book's going to be at the beginning, you're shortchanging your own creative juices. I think it's good to have an idea and then follow it along and and not be afraid to turn to the left or the right or change up what you thought like I said with a cover I had a cover and then I got together with a mastermind and they went mm, no it would look better this way and boom that made me smile mm, very nice and how great to have the feedback from people who you trust who can be objective and give you that perspective the best books are not done alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being on the podcast, Julianne. And thank you to you who is either watching this on our YouTube channel or listening to this on our audio platforms. Be sure to stay tuned next week for another show. Or if you are binge listening, You'll see the next one queued up right below the show. And thank you for investing your time learning more about writing to get business. Thank you, Pat. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business. And I have with me today, Mari Ryan, who is the author of The Thrive Hive. It is a compelling genre of books called a business fable. Tell our listener, Mari, what they will get by listening to your podcast. Well, I'm so excited to be here for this journey with you today, Pat, to be able to tell your listeners and viewers about my experience in writing my first book in the business fable genre. We have a story to tell, and stories are an important aspect of how we deliver our messages. And I used this format to be able to deliver an impactful message about workplaces and how organizations create cultures that look after their people. My journey included research by interviewing executives and a variety of approaches that I use to be able to create an award-winning book. Be sure to tune in to our podcast and have a chance to find out more about Mari Ryan and also you'll learn something fascinating about a whole species of creatures who work very hard on our planet to help bring us food. That's part of the fable. You'll have to read her book and find out about this podcast in order to know what we're talking about. Be sure to listen to Mari Ryan's podcast.